mentioned, this session is going to be focusing on Amazon SageMaker and discuss the different opportunities and and, uh, and things that you can do with SageMaker and in cooperation with other AWS services. Um, it assumes no knowledge or background on uh, on data science itself, uh, and we'll just be basically talking to how to build machine learning models, whether you're a developer or a data scientist. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. So looking first at what's happening in the industry, and obviously we see a large uh, volume of discussion around AI and ML, um, but specific to a lot of use cases, we do see the same kind of things coming up again and again. Um, we look, look at things like image recognition, so computer vision applied to image recognition to identify uh, whether there's a cat or a dog in a, a photo, as an example, or to be able to detect how many cats do we see inside the photo using single shot detectors for object detection. Um, speech recognition is very popular, and voice user interfaces are being developed, things like Amazon Alexa. Uh, as a example of that, uh, it's been largely very popular consumer device and, uh, and the use of speech, whether it be voice to text or text to voice, is a really popular use case for machine learning. And of course, anybody who's involved with any trading strategies where there's automated training, and we know that that's a very large scale uh, effort, uh, obviously those have to be driven by some form of algorithm and machine learning is a very popular approach to achieving that. And finally, being able to do sentiment analysis and do it in an automated fashion against whether it be your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed or, or whatnot. So uh, this obviously, these are use cases that apply across many different industries. And so um, these are things you can be thinking about as we talk about specifically how we build machine learning. Now, when we look at Amazon itself, amazon.com, uh, we've actually been involved with this for a very long time. Um, we started back in 97 with a recommendation service for notifications uh, so that if you're based on your past purchase history that you'd be notified uh, via email of a, uh, a recommendation for a book or, or something of that nature. Um, and so that was probably largely manual at the time, but uh, certainly there was a, there was a element that was uh, you know, done in the spreadsheets and finally into real true machine learning. And, uh, and so we've been doing this for a very long time. And uh, since then, we've grown our team to more than thousands of, the, we have thousands of engineers uh, that, that are focused specifically on machine learning today. And if we think about the categories or the, the areas that we focus that effort on, we could first look at fulfillment and logistics. And that first element is when we think about um, our Amazon Robotics, formerly Kiva Robotics, uh, it's about lifting up shelves and racks and bringing those to our pickers and our in our fulfillment, our warehouse uh, operations, uh, as well as monitoring the supply chain and uh, recommending best routing for product. Um, search and discovery, very common uh, use case where you need to be able to find among millions of items. Uh, that's a very common use case on Amazon.com. Um, you look at things like taking existing products and, and adding new features to them to extend those features. Uh, those products with these uh, AI and ML features. Um, and so you can think about if you have access to uh, Amazon Kindle, uh, there's an X-ray feature. It's also available inside our Amazon video, which allows you to better drill in and understand the content. Um, the, also, this can lead to completely new products, right? So the idea is that your voice user interface uh, the popularity of Alexa, that was a completely new product uh, and new service uh, such as Amazon Go, uh, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, and finally, the idea is that we apply that machine learning uh, back into AWS to try to help our customers, millions of customers, to uh, develop solutions of for their customers. So when we look at Amazon.com, very common website, you see that that recommendation engine has evolved over the years. And now you see things that are items related to things that you've viewed or similar items that have been purchased by others. Many re recommendations form the content that you experience when you're on Amazon.com. If you look at the Alexa devices, we've actually evolved that device platform. Uh, first, we introduced that in, in, as a household uh, device that would allow you to interact with it without a keyboard, without a mouse, uh, and to be able to do it in a natural way. 
um, using automated speech recognition and natural language understanding. Uh, so we've even evolved that product further by adding in video screens because the idea being that sometimes the information can be communicated back to you from that device in a visual form and that's actually sometimes more efficient. So we also have this retail, new retail concept called Amazon Go. Uh, and this is the experience of a cashierless uh, store experience or consumer experience. So the idea being that consumers can enter the store, um, that they can, they can pick up any objects that they wish to purchase, and they just walk out from the store. And it uses things like computer vision uh, and sensor fusion, RFID technology, be able to identify what were the items that were picked up by the consumers and then later charge them to their account. So again, removing essentially friction from the experience of purchasing product uh, in a convenient store setting. So when we think about all the different areas that we've touched on in 20 years, you can see there's a wealth of different areas. Demand forecasting, obviously a very large part of our operations, uh, machine translation, uh, robotics. Yeah. So we have a, a very large story and a, and a lot that we can share. Um, that leads us to a discussion about AWS and ML at AWS and what our mission is. And really it's all about democratizing AI and ML. And we want to put machine learning in the hands of every developer and data scientist. So everything that we talk about today is really geared or focused towards enabling even developers to be able to take advantage of machine learning today. So when we think about the, the wealth of different customers, the, the broad range and deep range of use of AWS for machine learning, it's quite a bit and you can look and see you know as a, a premier customer example you can look and see pinterest which is as all its visual search uh, it does that on aws in terms of building the machine learning as well as hosting that um, you can also see that there's capital one which is the largest credit card issuer in the us so the idea being that when they want to build their vision their voice user interfaces and their different uh different products uh and fraud monitoring, that's something that the Capital One chooses AWS for. Um, and FINRA, which monitors more than 50 billion market transactions every day that happen on NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange and other exchanges uh, and detecting fraud or some collusion or activity that's, um, that's being regulated by the US government, uh, all that's happening on AWS and using machine learning to do that, uh, it's being built by FINRA on AWS. So looking at the overall story of what does that comprise, because you can think about this actually in three different layers. You can think about users who just simply want an API-driven black box approach to AI, to AI and machine learning. So they can leverage some of these services at the very top layer uh, called application services here. We have things like recognition, which allow them to do computer vision and analyze, do facial uh, sentiment analysis or uh, to detect similarity between faces. Um, so these, that's feature of recognition. If you look at transcribe, the ability to take voice and turn it into text, uh, as well as translate, which goes between 24 different language pairs um, today. We have poly, which allows you to do natural sounding text to speech and it's used by companies like Duolingo, uh, who chose it over a number of other competitors because they found it was the best performing uh, and the most natural sounding voice they could find. Uh, and also you have Comprehend, which allows you to do uh, better text analysis to be able to understand what topics are being discussed or any sentiment within the text. Uh, and Lex, which is the same kind of technology that drives our Alexa device platform. Uh, and provides a natural language understanding uh, as well as a, uh, a uh, voice piece which allows you to build uh, a complete automated voice user interface solution, uh, particularly if you want to build a chatbot. So those services are available. Um, where there's not a fit, where there's a need to go deeper, um, that's where customers will start looking at the next layer down. So um, one of the first areas that well, one that we'll be discussing in depth is Amazon SageMaker. And that is a managed machine learning uh, solution which allows you to do uh, building, training, and deploying your machine learning models. 
and basically removes a lot of the undifferentiated heavy lifting that for years a lot of uh, data scientists have been left to do uh, on their own or develop solutions, custom bespoke solutions. Uh, but in this case, SageMaker takes care of a lot of that for you. Um, Amazon EMR, which is a traditional product we've had around for quite a while, and that's being used for Hadoop and Spark workloads, but specifically for machine learning, you know, customers who are using Spark, they'll often be using Spark ML, Spark ML Lib uh, to leverage that for doing machine learning for both training the models as well as doing inference as part of a batch process. So that's always available as well to our customers. Um, Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a crowdsourcing platform, which allows you to take, you know, a lot of the challenge of machine learning is labeling data. So it allows you to leverage the resources worldwide of, of several million people uh, to be able to bid out and uh, receive back labeled data, which then helps to train better and better models. And also we have finally the AWS Deep Lens, which was just launched at reInvent this past year. And that includes the capabilities to uh, deploy a small device. It's for proof of concept intended as proof of concept device, but it allows you to test out ideas quickly around computer vision uh, so that you can deploy a model from something like SageMaker and then detect uh, detect faces or detect uh, cat versus dog or, or these other computer vision tasks. And then finally, when we look at the lowest tier, the lowest layer, this is really where the heavy lifting occurs. And this is where uh, customers who really wish to have complete access to the operating system to be able to do everything and anything to uh, achieve the exact requirements that they have uh, can leverage things like our deep learning AMI. And that deep learning AMI has within it uh, several different open source frameworks as well as the drivers that are required for you to be able to leverage GPU processing from the NVIDIA, the latest NVIDIA processors. So the idea is that out of the box, you can spin up an instance, uh, an EC2 instance, our virtual server instances, uh, using the deep learning AMI that's available from marketplace um, at no cost uh, and use these open source tools and be able to immediately gain some, some value, uh, but do exactly what you want to achieve without uh, without any burden between you and the actual uh, low-level operating system and the uh, and the hardware, the underlying hardware. And of course, all of this is within a framework of AWS services that surround that, including things like Amazon S3, and we'll talk briefly on that topic uh, because it is a centerpiece to a lot of this because it involves object uh, storage and the ability to pull data in for training as well as storing that that uh, models that are created from the training process. So let's review the typical ML process. We always start with a business problem. We need to focus ourselves on what is the thing that needs to be achieved uh, before we even set about identifying data that's required and, and building models. So, you know, we have the business problem, we frame that as an ML problem. And the ML problem framing is gonna be focused on identifying what are the key success criteria that need to be addressed. So, what is the level of confidence that you need from your predictions? What are you trying to predict? Um, you know, do you need a human in the loop? Just defining that better before you even start out on your task. So you can define success before you start. So next, you look at a lot of the heavy lifting that happens within data uh, collection, integration. It's about identifying what data sources exist that are relevant to that, that machine learning problem and being able to then clean that data or identify issues with that data or missing data and determine how you want to deal with that. So it's all about the pre-process before you get to the actual training of machine learning models. And that's a majority of the effort of data scientists today. And then the next step is about ad hoc analysis, visualization of that data to be able to identify, you know, different correlations and patterns in that data and identify what is believed to be the relevant features from what has been found and, and possibly doing feature augmentation for each or engineering around that. And then that box of model training and parameter tuning becomes your next heavy lifting. And that's basically about um, running the models, uh, tr sorry, training the models, fitting the models, uh, and identifying the success of those models, and then identifying 
the hyperparameters that that led to that success. The hyperparameters being the metadata that essentially tells how the training process will will be handled. And then finally, you have a model evaluation step, of course. This, so this becomes an iterative process. You don't train once, you often train multiple times. You just keep going back and back, uh, trying to find the best results. And it's never a job that's completed. So if we look at the end of that, we actually would have to identify with that model evaluated, did it succeed at achieving our business problem? Uh, or meeting our business problem and achieving that uh, ML problem statement. And if you say no, then of course you're augmenting data. You have to go out and identify, are there additional data sources? Are there other things that you need to do uh, to address this? Maybe there's completely missing data and you have to start from scratch to start looking at what else had, needs to be collected. Uh, but then you also could potentially say that you need to do a bit deeper dive on the features themselves and there can be feature augmentation techniques that could be applied to the data in order to synthesize or to add additional uh, features that can help uh, to guide uh, a better outcome for your model evaluation. And finally, if your business goals are met, then you can move forward, but your job's not done and that's where you have to actually take the model that you've you've created and you have to deliver it into production and that becomes a real challenge because now you're asked to, to basically deploy can do do continuous deployment uh do a kind of devops approach in terms of how you're going to slipstream that new model into production and then how do you monitor that endpoint how do you scale that endpoint so this becomes a challenge uh because now you're throwing that model over the wall and somebody else is responsible for it but but someone on the data engineering team or even the data scientist has to be responsible for doing that last mile of delivering the model into production. So, and eventually, of course, you're capturing data and you're you're putting that back in and you're retraining based on this additional data. You're hoping you're going to get better and better results over time. So, if we break this out as what does AWS do for you? Well, with the first block. We can't do a lot other than to give you advice about what we've seen as I started the conversation with different ML use cases that we observe. Um, and we do have a resource called ML Solutions Lab. I'll, I'll mention it towards the end again, uh, which can help you a bit with that. We also have ProServe resources. We can do discovery workshops. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really gonna be about what you identify as your problem and what your domain knowledge tells you about that particular issue. So we can definitely assist, but we don't have any services outright other than our, our different solutions of ProServe and ML Solutions Lab. But now when we get to the data collection piece, we actually can start to isolate and identify services that are available right now from AWS that can help you solve these different challenges with data collection, with data integration, uh, with transforming that data, um, with being able to scan that data as it sits latent inside something like S3. So let's go through from the top. We have Amazon S3, and that's it's object storage. And if you've used AWS before, this is one of the most common services. But uh, for those that haven't, it's the idea that you have a durable storage that you can put uh, objects into, and it becomes a key value store. You can pull out uh, that data, or you can choose to compress it or secure it, uh, or have it a part of a data lifecycle and be able to have that, uh, that data basically move to a cold storage format. So the idea is that it, it gives you a complete storage solution. So S3 is a, is a basis for often for companies' data lakes. And so the idea is that you can store all your data in S3 and you can have it be a part of this overall machine learning process. So that's part of the data platform. We have a new tool that just came out, a new service called AWS Glue, which does a managed extract transform load. Uh, we have another called Amazon Athena, which is for doing ad hoc query against the data that's sitting at rest inside S3. We have Amazon EMR, as I mentioned that earlier, and then uh, Amazon Redshift and Amazon Redshift Spectrum, which offer you petabyte scale data warehouse uh, capability, uh, which is then accessible via Postgres or SQL style, uh, Postgres compatible SQL style uh, querying. So there's a lot of different solutions in there. This is all about pre-processing the data and preparing it for use in your machine learning. We are not going to talk in depth about any of these topics, but I do believe that there's other topics that, or there's other uh, sessions talking to these areas. So uh, Ganesh has been covering 
occurring on the data lake side. That's a that's a definitely well worth uh, tuning in for, as well as Luke covering the storage solution. So uh, please do attend or review those other webcasts that were part of this. Um, and then after we have the data in a, in a prepared format, this is when we can actually start to use SageMaker. This is where SageMaker begins. And so SageMaker first starts as a managed notebook environment. So for those who are not data scientists, who have never used uh, data science uh, tools, um, there's a tool called Jupyter Notebook. And the Jupyter Notebook is essentially an interactive REPL. Uh, it's read, execute, print, and loop. And that's the idea that you can execute commands in a managed environment, and that those commands are written in Python or, or a number of other languages, uh, depending on the, the way that you've configured Jupyter. And what data scientists often do is they use these tools, use Jupyter Notebooks, as a method for sharing their data and their experiments with each other. So it's become kind of a best practice to use notebooks as a, a form of communication. That means that they include both documentation as well as executable code. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. We'll actually look at the console and we'll actually look at a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, that's the first offering from SageMaker. Bear in mind that SageMaker is an a la carte service. That means that while I'm going to mention a few different features of SageMaker, you have the option of using or not using any of these features. So, for instance, if you find that you don't want to use SageMaker for its managed notebooks, that's completely up to you. You can still take advantage of the training as well as the deployment of the endpoints. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking to at, at length. So bear in mind as we talk about this, this is not you must use everything that we're talking about. You actually can pick and choose what it is you, you like about SageMaker, what fits your particular workflow. Because SageMaker is not a workflow for machine learning. It is actually a pipeline set. It's a set of tools that allow you to pipeline your particular workflow. And so it's always up to you whether you wish to adopt or not adopt pieces of SageMaker. Uh, so, so the notebook environments, the managed notebook environments are provided for you. That's one of the key aspects of SageMaker. And the second aspect is that you actually can spin up and run your training instances for training the machine learning models. That actually is all provided to you via SageMaker as a one click or one line of code that when you call the API and you call this API.fit and doing fit basically instructs it to spin up a number of servers, as many servers as you wish, and it will do the training, the machine learning training, build the model, and then at the end of that training, it will shut the servers back down again. Those servers will, it will be only executing or pay, you will only pay per second for that execution at a minimum of one minute. Uh, and so the execution of those, those, uh, the server training is actually completely ephemeral, and it's something that once you're finished, those servers go away. Actually, it's managed cluster of servers. Uh, those, those instances of the, the containers that are running your source code will exit, and they'll no longer be charged. So that means you can take advantage of very powerful machine learning hardware, using again NVIDIA Volta as an example of the latest NVIDIA processors, you could use those processors and have an extreme amount of processing power uh, and not have to pay any more than per second for the amount of time you actually use for training. So that those two pieces are very important. And then the next aspect is you actually have the last mile delivery where you can actually deploy deploy a real-time endpoint, which is auto-scalable, which provides you with monitoring and debugging. If you've used AWS before, it uses CloudWatch, for both the metrics and the logs, to be able to monitor what is happening inside the instances that host the API endpoint. Those API endpoints are accessible either privately within your own VPC, your virtual private cloud, or they can be publicly hosted. And so you have this flexibility in terms of how you want to deploy the API endpoint, but you still gain the benefits of the managed, uh, the managed service of it managing all the auto-scaling pieces for you, managing the deployment of the model itself, uh, monitoring those endpoints, as well as allowing you to do A-B testing so that if you do develop a new model, which happens all the time, 
uh, as you develop better and better models, you'll continue to push those into production and it gives you a seamless way of introducing that via A-B testing. So let's take, Am that's Amazon SageMaker, let's take Amazon SageMaker against the process that we've just talked about. What we're doing is we're taking the same process that we've just discussed related to machine learning and we've laid it out flat. And, and so the very first two steps are covered by the build process inside SageMaker. And so, as mentioned, it provides pre-built notebooks where you can spin up a Jupyter notebook and have access to all of this compute power. And from there, execute training functions and, and uh, your fitting as well as your deployment. So the next piece of it is that you have these built-in high-performance algorithms that are provided as first-party algorithms within SageMaker supported by AWS. And so let's take a look at what, what these approaches to the training actually includes. So the SageMaker built-in algorithms, we have 14, sorry, 13 different uh, algorithms. Uh, the, you, can, the, you can see some of the most common algorithms. If you're familiar with data science, you'd recognize many of these names, but I'll just run through them for those who haven't really had familiarity. We have k-means clustering, which gives you the ability to specify a certain number of centroids and be able to identify clusters of, of uh, different different pieces within your data. So the idea is that if you have data set and you want to just, in an unsupervised way, just see where things cluster, you can use something like k-means, a very common algorithm. You can use a PCA or principal component analysis to be able to identify uh, high dimensional data can be reduced in dimensionality and still not lose information. And by squeezing it, essentially, you can create faster results or better results in your later downstream uh, machine learning processing. You have neural topic modeling, where you can analyze text, uh, factorization machines, which allow you to do matrix factorization. And it's a very common uh, use case for that would be recommendation engines. You have linear learner, which allows you to do both linear regression as well as logistic regression. Uh, XGBoost, which does gradient boosting and is a very common open source package for uh, solving machine learning, uh, both linear and, and logistic regressions. You have latent Dirichlet allocation, which allows you to identify spectral topics that may underline different, uh, different pieces of uh, text. You have image classification, as mentioned earlier, the idea of detecting whether something's a cat or a dog or whatever it is that you're trying to do. Uh, it could be identifying logos, uh, but whatever your business requirement is around image classification, it can automate the classification of, of different uh, images that are provided to it. Sequence to sequence, which is focused on machine translation. Um, deep AR forecasting, which is about identifying next the next uh, predicted steps in a time series based on several other time series. So the idea is that when things move together, you can actually learn across time series and you can try to better predict what would be the next one or two or three hours or days or weeks of production or the demand that could be coming in. Uh, blazing text, which allows you to embed words into numbers, which is a, another important bit for machine learning. Uh, random cut forest, which allows you to do an anomaly detection. So the idea being that if you see something that's completely strange or an outlier, Random Cut Forest is actually very good at identifying outliers inside of a data set. And K-Nearest Neighbor, which would identify similarities between items. And so the idea is that it classifies items potentially as uh, being very similar and tagging things together potentially. So you could identify uh, these are similar products or these are similar types of people. And Object Detection, which is uh, the single shot detection which is provided that you can do a count of items or identify individual items inside of an image uh, so you can actually get better detail than even just an image classification. So the next choice is that if none of that works for your use case, and these are very common algorithms that were offered, uh, but if those things don't work and if there's a need to go deeper, then one option you have is to write your own Docker file and specify all of the necessary code uh, and implement your own algorithm. Uh, and it can still be supported inside SageMaker as long as you follow specific conventions. So it's, it's about creating a Docker file, it's about creating source code uh, and checking that all into a Docker repository and providing that access 
uh, to SageMaker so that SageMaker can execute your Docker container and uh, fire your code and do the training uh, without you having to manage all the heavy lifting of doing all that. So the next option is to use SageMaker frameworks and SageMaker framework SDKs for deep learning networks. Uh, you have things like TensorFlow and MXNet and Chainer and PyTorch SDKs. So the idea is that this is a bit higher level. So between, you may have noticed that in the previous, uh, previous list of bring your own algorithms, there was also MXNet, there was also TensorFlow, there's PyTorch, um, there's actually Chainer in that as well. Uh, those things can all be done. That's complete customizable in the previous. But in the case of the SageMaker framework SDKs, this simplifies it considerably. So you don't have to write your own Docker file. You just simply specify your TensorFlow file or your MXNet file. And if you follow a specific convention for how, uh, how the file will be called, how SageMaker will call your file, then uh, you can actually execute your TensorFlow code as, as regular TensorFlow code, just following specific conventions around training and deployment. And finally, we have the ability to integrate with Spark. So if you are running Spark workloads today and you have pipelines uh, related to Spark, you can actually integrate, uh, integrate SageMaker into that pipeline as a part of that overall ETL process. Um, so that you can actually gain the benefits of your existing Spark pipeline uh, and the SageMaker at the same time. So the next aspect that we'll look at is one-click training. So as I mentioned earlier, I said it's one-click or actually it's one API call uh, to the SageMaker interface that then would execute the training for a particular machine learning model. It also has the ability, a feature of SageMaker is hyperparameter tuning. And I'm gonna go into more detail about hyperparameter tuning because it's a very important point and I think a very important part of the value proposition of using SageMaker. So I'll, I'll come back to that in more detail as soon as we've covered off some of the other aspects. And then finally, you have the deployment. So you're deploying that model into production. You have this fully managed hosting with auto scaling. This is using under the covers all the auto scaling mechanisms that are already currently available to you if you're using AWS, if you use EC2 instances, uh, it just simplifies the interface. So the idea is that you have a completely managed service, you specify the minimum number of instances, the maximum number of instances, and it will follow your instructions and it will spin up the exact instance types you've asked for, the number of instance types, and it will host that model for you as well as give you CloudWatch metrics and CloudWatch logging around those instances so you can monitor and see what's happening with them. So if we think about, we've looked at a lot of things. So I wanna put this into context and make you think about how would you actually use this, right? So when we think about the first step, the first step is preparing the data and that's where the Sage Mar SageMaker notebooks, the managed notebooks you know, would come to play to be able to analyze that raw raw data and then maybe create prepared data sets that then you can do your initial training with. Now on the long term, that's not the solution. The solution is that once you've identified a proper preparation routine, you would actually go back and start doing your ETL and actually use tools like Glue to do that on a managed regular basis. But during the exploration phases and during those, those feature engineering uh, moments where you're trying to identify what actually is relevant to your, your business case or your machine learning problem, you actually are, are gonna be doing a lot of iteration, a lot of look at these maybe smaller subsets of data to do the immediate training. So in this diagram, we're showing this raw data into the notebook instance and, and prepared data back out to Amazon S3. And that certainly is applicable in any investigative uh, portion of your machine learning. But once you've identified essentially a production state that you're gonna always be using the same features and you need this to be using millions of rows of data, that it was probably actually better left to the data preparation stages that I mentioned earlier, the tools that I mentioned earlier. So I don't wanna confuse anyone with that, but I do wanna note that that's actually designating that this, this is more for just ad hoc analysis and preparing that data for an initial test to see if the training is going to be successful or not. So once we've got the prepared data in place and we actually 
basically feed that training data into uh, the managed training uh, portion of, of, of SageMaker. Uh, we also have the optimization of the tuning portion, which is an iterative process. So the idea is that the training would not happen just once. So looking at that middle portion, that HPO with the little loop, it's representing hyperparameter optimization or the hyperparameter tuning that's going to occur. As part of any machine learning workload, often data scientists have to keep tweaking and tweaking uh, those meta values, those, those hyperparameters to obtain the best possible results. So once there's an outcome from that, any of those outcomes, the, anytime you've trained a model, every single time it's deploying that trained model out back to S3. And that S3 location is up to you. You determine that. And once you've placed that trained model into S3, now the next logical step is you want to host that. And that's where we talked about the endpoint. So the SageMaker hosting comes into play and it becomes an API that's available. Now imagine your users out on the out side are wanting to access that endpoint. So often you actually want to pre pre-process or to actually make sure that they don't have direct access to the API. You would actually want to abstract that and place an API gateway interface as well as an AWS Lambda function to call the SageMaker hosting endpoint on their behalf. So it becomes the SageMaker hosting piece is probably more of a uh, part of a microservice architecture that's being called as part of some larger process. So the idea is that if it's maybe a fraud check when the user is doing his checkout or maybe it's doing the recommendation based on the user's current page, um, often it would be abstracted in a way where you're actually first calling against an API gateway based on the user interactions and that those user interactions are driving a Lambda function. A Lambda function is just simply a small piece of code, a, literally a programmatic, programmatic function that then is responsible for calling the SageMaker hosting an endpoint and doing the inference against that to maybe, again, recommend a list of books or uh, detect if there's some kind of fraudulent activity uh, based on the users use case. So having said all that, a lot of different uh, slides here, I want to switch over and I want to show you what the console looks like and I want to walk you through what SageMaker looks like, the notebook instances, the training, and how that all works. So let's go ahead and jump over to that. And this is actually the AWS console but on the service page for Amazon SageMaker. And we see the overview, we have the notebooks, the training, and the inference aspects and they're also listed over here. So the first thing we would typically do is we would do a creation of a notebook instance. So in this case, I'm just going to give it a name. I can give it anything up to 63 characters. Uh, anything, it has to have hyphens and no spaces. And you can now specify an instance type. These instance types re represent the capacity in which the, that notebook instance will have in terms of its compute and uh, its, its amount of memory. So you can choose very small or very large. And the, these are actually all GPU accelerated uh, computing environments which allow you to do uh, really fast training. But because the notebook is not intended for training itself, the notebook is intended to just simply give you a control area through which you'll actually call training against other instances. So while you could certainly spin up a P3 16X large, you will be paying for the most expensive notebook instance, but not necessarily using it in the way that it would be intended. So I just want to caution you that probably you want to look at something more reasonable because this notebook will then become that control panel through which you will be executing your ad hoc query, you'll be analyzing your data, and then you'll be issuing commands against the other components in SageMaker to do training and endpoint hosting. So I'm just going to choose an M4 X large instance. Uh, there's a full list of information about what these actually mean, uh, but I'm going to I'm going to elide that for now. Um, so we're going to look at you have to have a role in which you're going to actually execute commands inside your notebook. So in other words, I, it will give you permission to things like those S3 buckets I mentioned earlier. You can create a brand new role and you can specify the S3 buckets that that notebook instance will have access to. It has a number of different conventions. You can choose whether it's going to support uh, anything with the name SageMaker in it so that you don't have to worry about creating multiple roles. 
you can choose exactly how you want your securities to be. Or you could say, I want it to have access any of my S3 buckets. It's the least secure approach, but it is an option. And then if I select, I've already created this role. So I'm gonna just go ahead and select that role. Um, VPC is our virtual private cloud. And it's essentially like a network that sits inside AWS. You control that network, you create those networks. And from uh, inside those networks, you'll often have hosted data. It could be RDS data, a recent relational database service data. It could be Redshift data I had mentioned earlier as the petabyte uh, scale data warehouse. Um, so the idea is that if you have resources inside the VPC, you can, uh, you can assign this notebook to attach itself to a VPC. If you wish to restrict access to the internet, Perhaps you have some compliance requirements, some regulatory reasons or, or some other reasons why you decide that the notebook instances should not have access to the internet. And it could be very useful for ensuring that uh, if you have contractors working for you that they do not have the ability to egress data uh, conveniently from their notebook instance. So the idea is that using these pieces, you can help lock down and control the security of access to your data. We're choosing not to do VPC. Um, there's also the option of lifecycle configuration. And inside this, it gives you the ability to actually assign a script that can either start every time the notebook starts, or it'll start the very first time the notebook is created. So these are just bash scripts. You can give it any command you wish to tell it how to uh, launch. And so for instance, you may actually decide if you have a team of developers or data scientists, you may decide there's certain packages you want installed by default inside the notebook instances. You can assign that to a lifecycle configuration and then assign that lifecycle configuration to a new notebook instance. Uh, you have the ability to use our key management services to encrypt the hard drives in which you'll be running those notebook instances. So that's an option. Uh, we're not going to choose to do any encryption today. Um, and you can assign uh, tags. Tags can be assigned to notebook instances, to training instances. So when you spin up training, it can actually be tagged. This is important because then you can actually track and see costs where things have been. Maybe there's cost centers that have to be charged back to uh, related to any machine learning. So it's a very, very powerful mechanism and it's part of the overall AWS uh, infrastructure or environment. Uh, that you can assign tags to different things and be able to track the uh, the activities based on that. So I'm going to go ahead and hit create, but we are not going to wait until that finishes. It's going to take a couple minutes, uh, but we don't have time to wait. So we're just going to jump in and look at one that's already up and running. Uh, so this is a notebook instance. When I click open, I'm basically launching a secure URL that is going through HTTPS and allowing you access to that server. That means that there's no ports being open to the internet and also it respects our IAM permissions for accessing to that note, Jupyter Notebook. So essentially it's ensuring that your securities are consistent and everything is validated in terms of activities uh, in attaching to this instance. So when we come in here, we see a number of different notebooks and I'll explain kind of what the notebooks look like. Uh, but we actually can see a tab up here called SageMaker Examples. So inside there, we can see a number of different examples of uh, what you can do with SageMaker. It gives a number of different applied use cases for SageMaker uh, for machine learning and using SageMaker to achieve that. Uh, it shows you what I talked about before with the high level um, framework SDKs, where you can see examples of how to run MXNet or PyTorch or TensorFlow inside the SageMaker environment using that high level SDK. DK, it talks about those built-in algorithms that we, we had mentioned earlier, which allows you to see some examples of how does that all work. So we're actually going to look at an example, but before I do that, I want to also point something out. For those people who know what Jupyter is and they're used to running Jupyter on notebooks, the first question may be, why would I want to run it uh, as a managed service? Well, you know, it certainly adds a lot of value to be able to just quickly spin up or close down a Jupyter instance via API call. The second aspect is that if you're pulling data from AWS and using S3 for the benefits that it provides and you have a data lake, you want to use something that's in the cloud so that you're not pulling data out of AWS and, and having the restrictions of your local bandwidth to be able to access all of that data. 
So the idea is getting that notebook instance as close as you can, whether it's your own hosted EC2 instance running notebook server, or whether you use Jupyter, the idea is that that's your choice, but it is definitely recommended best practice that you'd be running that Jupyter notebook in the cloud. Oftentimes people will run things on a local machine or they'll be running it in a different way, but it's it's been seen as a best practice in terms of being able to run that as close to the data as possible. And if your concern is about any ability to do changes to that instance, beyond just the lifecycle configuration I mentioned before, you actually have full shell access to that instance. So there's nothing restricting you from actually, we can take a look and see what, uh, we can see this is an Amazon Linux instance. We can actually do a yum install because Amazon Linux is a CentOS based uh, operating system. And you can just show here how powerful it is, is that I could actually install HTBD. I can install pretty much any package I wish. So you're not restricted at all. You are a root user on that instance and you can actually shut it down. You can kill it. You can make it very bad. Uh, you can mess it up a lot, uh, but the idea is that it's not restricting you from doing what's necessary as a data scientist or developer uh, from achieving results. So I want to be very clear, even though this is managed, it is not protecting you from uh, your own uh, changes that could cause, could possibly stop it or kill it, uh, but it gives you the power then to do exactly what you want to do and what you want to achieve inside your notebook instance. So going back to what we're doing inside the instance, let's let's take a look at that. Um, here's an example notebook. And so as mentioned, a notebook consists often of text and code. So this is all just text and it can be edited on the fly if necessary. But this is, this is Jupyter and Jupyter is something you can find out a lot about. There's many resources on the internet to find out about uh, Jupyter. Uh, it's probably outside the scope to talk in too much detail about it, but I did have some questions on the earlier webinar about it. I do recommend you go to, uh, to search on uh, YouTube about Jupyter. There's a lot of uh, documentation about it. It's an open source software and it gives you this ability to execute Python uh, code inside of a, again, this, this web-based REPL environment. So I'm going to show you, this has already been processed so we can actually see the, the code that was executed and then the outcome from that code execution. And so we'll see something very interesting here is that we're using again an S3 bucket. We could control what those S3 buckets are. They're your buckets and you specify where the, in the uh, uh, training and test data is gonna be located as well as the output model. Um, you have a number of different steps that are happening, but I'm gonna scan forward in the interest of time and just show you what happens when I wanna do actually tra uh, training. And this is using the k-means uh, k-means uh, algorithm for the estimator for k-means uh, to execute the training. It's first specifying a role in which it's going to execute. It's telling it the number of training instances. In this case, I've specified two instances will be used for training. And next, it will specify that uh, I'm specifying the type of instance, the output location for that. The, the K, which is referring to the number of clusters that I'm going to try to achieve uh, the analysis with, and then the uh, location for the inbound data. And then I do a fit, and this is what I mentioned earlier. There's one call, you're doing a fit, and this spins up the necessary servers to do training. And if you look down here, you can see actually that there's two different servers working at the problem. It's green and red, if you're uh, able to see that. And you can see that the actual log file is being written by both of those instances. There's log being written by both those instances. So it becomes quite uh, efficient at doing multi uh, uh, distributed training uh, using the support algorithms that support it. So as an example, K-Mean supports it. Um, there's a number of different algorithms that support it. So you can do, you can essentially achieve results faster. Um, then the next step is, I have to deploy that for production, and I had mentioned before that you can do dot deploy, and again, you can specify the, the initial number of instances, you could specify a maximum number of instances, and then you specify the size of the instances. And so you actually get an endpoint at the end, which now you can send some data to that endpoint using the predictor, or you can actually access it as a RESTful interface and then get back a result. So it's I'm not gonna go into detail about this example because 
All of these examples are, are actually available on uh, GitHub. You can actually find them at the links, and I'll provide the links as part of the deck. But inside there, this all these uh, different folders relate to uh, the actual thing that I saw earlier here, these uh, here, Amazon algorithms. So this is a list of Amazon-based algorithms that are being updated constantly. And it's the same list that you find under the SageMaker examples. This is all the same code. So if you choose to just want to investigate and you want to go to GitHub and you want to look at exactly how the notebooks look, then you can do that. Um, but the end of this was that it wrote the data to S3, it wrote out uh, the model to S3 after training, and then that model was used from S3 to deploy out to an endpoint, and then everything was automated and all within SageMaker. And again, you could choose whether you decide you don't want to do, uh, you don't want to do training on, on SageMaker, for example, and you just want to use the deployment for the endpoint. There's examples in here of how to do that. So for advanced functionality. There's examples of bring your own model. And the idea is that you don't have to train on SageMaker. You could actually bring your own existing model into SageMaker and have that hosted for you, potentially. Um, and then there's also a lot of examples around how to run those SDKs that I mentioned earlier. So a lot of examples around TensorFlow using the high-level SDK, but even more complex examples. So I really recommend that you go and take a look at some of that piece, and I will now talk about uh, we'll talk about another portion, which is the architecture. So, as mentioned, there's actually containers that are being used that you're writing uh, either you're writing a Docker file for, or you're leveraging SageMaker's existing built-in algorithms or the high-level SDKs. They all constitute a Docker file that's then checked into the Elastic Container Registry. So whether those are SageMaker managed or whether they're managed by you, you can follow the convention, you can create uh, your own Docker file, which then can be used and merged with your training data to be able to execute and do a training of a model. At the end of that training, that model can actually be pushed out to S3. The model then can be picked up again and you can choose to uh, essentially create a second container for inference code, or you could even potentially use the same container again. That's usually the convention. And the inference code, that dot deploy will execute and it will pull in the container for the deployment and it will merge it with the model that's been trained. And then it becomes available as an endpoint. Again, in this illustration, we have the client directly accessing the endpoint, but you probably want to consider some kind of abstraction in the middle. And the inference request and the inference response occurs as a RESTful interface, or you can use the SDK to access it. The final thing is you record the ground truth back to S3. That's not being handled by SageMaker. That's not part of SageMaker. And I just want to get to this point. I think this is the most important. We mentioned something about hyperparameter tuning. And so hyperparameter tuning, imagine these, these sound boards where there's a sound engineer that's on top of you know, all these different knobs. And that's really the challenge for most machine learning uh, practitioners is to be able to identify what knobs to turn to what levels uh, during the process. It can cause wildly different responses based on those knobs. So imagine if you have all these knobs in front of you that represent hyperparameters, how are you going to do your machine learning training? Well, you know, this is just an example coming from the SageMaker screen of one particular algorithm and all the different hyperparameters that you could be dealing with. So you're talking about a number of different little knobs that have to be addressed. And now the first option that, cust that uh, customers, that machine learning practitioners can do is to do a full grid search. That means you you have to search across every possibility. That means it becomes combinatorially, it becomes very expensive compute wise to try to address. But we would think of that as just like with two different parameters, it would be a loop inside of a loop. But you're checking an exhaustive search of every possible parameters. At some point, it's not possible. And that's why actually it turns out out that rather than doing a strict grid search, according to uh, different documents that have been published, you actually can find better results from doing a random search, completely random search, uh, actually performs better. And there's links to the survey or the um, research paper around that that you can re research and find. So now let's say we did the same thing. We're just trying to randomly guess and we just run through a range of possibilities. Um, so that would be our code if we were writing this as code. 
right? And so often data scientists do have to write this as code or they have to do something to manually address this problem of searching that space. So there's actually a third process that learns from the past. The idea is that each time and each step that you do your, your training, you actually can learn from your machine learning uh, parameters and try to make a better guess based on your previous experience. Your prior, priors can help educate you and make a better choice for the next set. And so we have within SageMaker, we have an implementation of Bayesian optimization, which allows you to address that and get better results and optimize uh, in a way that's automated. So you're putting machine learning on top of machine learning. So let's just quickly look at that. And we have over here uh, hyperparameter optimization, an example. And we're just using the SageMaker library. And that library, again, while I'm showing you everything as part of our notebook instances, this is just as accessible if you installed SageMaker library, if you're a Python uh, user, you just do pip install uh, SageMaker. There's actually documentation on all of this in terms of how to use the library itself. This doesn't require you to run inside the notebook instance. This is just a convenience for us to be able to illustrate and communicate as uh, uh, between people what is happening inside this notebook. But there's a lot of different options and there's things that you can do to automate all of this because it's just Python code. So you can see that there's actually a tuner object and you're importing or tuner library. Inside the tuner library, there's a different parameters that you might be investigating. So it has an integer, a categorical, and a continuous parameter, as well as a hyperparameter tuner object. And so what happens is you specify the, let's move down here. You specify to tune, and you can ignore this. It's just an estimator object. We saw it earlier called k-means, and the idea is that it gives it all the information it needs about the training job itself. But more interestingly for a hyperparameter tuning job is we want to give it a range of values we want it to test. So here's three different hyperparameters that are going to be tested, and if you assign it then to a promising range of values, it will investigate using Bayesian optimization at each iteration. It'll try to investigate the best best set of values within those ranges. It also has the ability to have multiple different outputs that are judged to determine whether we're getting closer or further from a good result. And this is for custom use, you have the ability to customize this registry, or this, sorry, this regular expression uh, to be able to actually scan the logs and identify the outcomes. And then finally, we have uh, we have the number of jobs being run. It's going to run nine jobs. It's going to run three in parallel. So it's going to be three iterations of three jobs. Each time it's going to be informing it. Each time it's going to set new parameters. So I'm not just going to. That's the end of it. It actually is the end of this. If I jump over to the uh, to an example of what this looks like, once you run it. You can see here we have a uh, MXNet job that ran. This is the exact same code, but I uh, ran it earlier. And we have a number of training jobs. It had nine jobs run, as we discussed, but each one had a different outcome, right? So the only thing that changed was the hyperparameters. The training data didn't change. The test data didn't change. Everything was consistent, but the only thing changed from one iteration to the next was the hyperparameters that were used. And if I go to the completed, uh, if I go to, sorry, best training job, I can actually see the exact values that were used that gave me the best performance. So for data scientists, this is a, this is a relief because it provides an automated mechanism that will essentially take away a lot of the heavy lifting that comes from an iterative task of trying different uh, hyperparameters. So this is, uh, this is a big part. The final part that I want to share is I mentioned about endpoints and API and hosting that as you run the training jobs you only pay per second for the training job execution but when you run the endpoints you are paying on a 7 by 24 basis for that real-time inference so the choice is if you choose you do not want to run that machine learning live uh, model on a regular you know minute by minute basis and you want to instead use it in a traditional batch transform uh, mode perhaps you're scoring credit on a nightly basis, you can actually use batch transformation. And it's the same model, which is that you choose a type of instance, and then you give it a, a input data, and then it'll actually run predictions against that and store the output as part of the batch transform job. It'll store the output to S3, uh, de de determined by you.
So those pieces are all uh, about the hyperparameters. There's additional resources that are available. The links that I talked about that I shared with you in examples. There's also a workshop to give you a more fully comprehensive idea of how to use SageMaker. Here's the documentation about the actual libraries, the, uh, the Python SDK that I mentioned earlier and you saw the documents for, and then uh, the SageMaker Spark uh, as well. Um, I did want to call out Amazon Machine Learning Solutions Lab, which again is about leveraging AWS expertise, our data scientist for your particular domain issue. And you can engage with us and identify a proof of concept with us. We can help you brainstorm, model, and also teach your teams, whether you have data scientists who are experienced or not experienced, we can help teach you our best practices and share with you those. Uh, as part of the ML Solutions Lab engagement. So that will typically be a face-to-face, -face, hands-on with your data scientists and our ML Solutions Lab team uh, in order to achieve results around your proof of concept needs. And we have a training offer. So the idea is that if you are wishing to prove your knowledge and cert certify on AWS, um, you certainly are encouraged to pursue a certification in big data as a specialty. And you can find out more about that on aws.training site. Uh, in order to obtain uh, free digital training around uh, a number of these steps. Uh, so Q&A, a couple of things that I've uh, gotten questions on here. Is there R support? Yes, R, R is supported, and we actually have a number of examples inside that examples directory. Um, I want to also mention that R Studio is supported. You can use the Reticulate package. There's actually an entire blog post on this. Uh, using R with SageMaker, that's a that's uh, just search on R SageMaker on the machine learning blog, and it'll give you details of exactly. It'll actually spin up an R Studio instance. You can use Reticulate, and you can actually spin up the training uh, not inside R but inside of uh, the SageMaker. And then uh, another question I had was about. Um, what's the, uh, is there any choice in terms of S3 as the source for the data? It, there is no choice. If you're running SageMaker and you're running the training instances, the data has to be placed into S3 and the output will always be S3 as well. And then finally, the question was about Lambda, whether you, if you want to do real-time inference with Lambda, you can do that. But the question will be about how large your models become as you're trying to do inference. So this is something that you have to be cautious and you have to look at what are the sizes of the Lambda instances, not the Lambda instances, but Lambda configuration that you choose. So I know I've run over quite a bit. I really do appreciate uh, all of your attention to this and uh, I hope that you've gotten a lot out of it. If you haven't, and if you have, it, either way, we wanna hear back from you and we really wanna hear about what uh, other things you wanna hear about uh, specific to data lakes, specific to big data analytics and, and machine learning. So please do share your feedback and complete the surveys. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining and, and uh, my apologies for running over.